After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand project and shared coordinates and acquire coordinates. The objective domains covered of 5.4b understand the concept of shared coordinates. Coordination between real world coordinates and your Revit projects requires special attention. Getting this information wrong can be very costly and lengthen the project delivery times. In order to fully understand this subject, you must first understand each datum in Revit and its purpose. The project base point, by default, is positioned on top of the internal point and should remain clipped. There is a geometry limit of 20 miles around the project base point. The survey point should be placed at the origin of the coordinate system and remain at 0, 0, 0, or placed at a local survey station with the associated coordinates. The project base point should be located on a setting out point that can be clearly established out in sight. For example, this may be the intersection of two grids. A site model is simply another Revit model that can contain one or more Revit models and other civil features such as drainage and topography. The structural model is linked into the coordinated site model and the coordinates are acquired and saved into your model. A link has now been established between the two Revit models. Go ahead and open up file 004, Uncoordinated Model. The model should open up in the site plan. Here we have a structural layout that's modelled from Revit's internal origin point. The internal origin point and the project base point will share the same location, which is the datum of Revit. It should have the coordinates by default of 0 for the north, 0 for the east, 0 for the elevation and 0 for angle to true north. Our structural model has been located at our grid setting out point, grids A1. At this particular point, we may not have any survey information to base the levels and position on. So we've established here that we're going to use a local setting out point, which is grid A1. And we're going to assume that the ground floor is, in fact, modelled at zero feet. So if we open up the south elevation, you can see also the ground floor is situated at zero feet. So our next task is to coordinate this model. In order to do this, we're going to need to link it into our site model. So this model will need to be closed down. So click File and then Close. You then go ahead and open up the file 004, Understand the concept of shared coordinates. Our model opens up in the site plan. Before we start, let's review some of the documents that are linked into this model. Let's start with the AutoCAD drawing. So this AutoCAD drawing has come from the surveyor. It's been drawn in its real world position and rotated to its real world position. So the surveyor has prepared all of this information. You'll also note that the local setting out point has been marked on the survey. That information has been transferred across to our project base point. In this example, it was manually typed in, but you could also acquire the coordinates from the CAD model. The survey point has been positioned, in this case, to a known survey station with the correct coordinates. We also have a Revit topo surface included in the project. The topo surface has come from Civil 3D. So our next task here is to link in our structural project. On the Insert ribbon, select Link Revit. In the Import Link Revit dialog box, Let's go ahead here and select 004, Uncoordinated Model. Do make sure that the positioning is set to Auto Origin to Origin. This will ensure that the two models are positioned on the internal origin. Let's go ahead and open that. So the only task for us to do now is to take our Revit model and rotate it to match the survey. To do this, let's select our linked Revit model on the ribbon, we'll go ahead and click the rotate command. Let's also make sure that we place the center of rotation at the base point. To do this, we can click place on the options bar. I'm going to zoom right away in. 
and then use the tab key to make sure that I pick the point. Note in the status bar in the bottom left hand corner of Revit, it now says point site project base point. I click here. Then I need to define a position along grid A. So I'm going to pick a point over here somewhere. This is just an arbitrary point, but it must be on the grid. And to define a second point of rotation, we can pick the pink line representing grid A. So that's this pink line along here. And again, I can pick any arbitrary point along that as long as it's on that line. Our Revit model is now positioned. However, we still need to make sure that this has its correct elevation or Z height. To do this, we have a section here cut through the project base point called the structural pad. Let's go ahead and open that section up. So here's our linked Revit model. This model now simply needs to be moved from the top of concrete here to the pad level. To do this, we can select the move command. We can pick on the top of concrete. Note that the constraint option is switched on on the options bar. And what we'll then do is snap to the pad. In the project browser, let's open up the 3D view. And you can now note that our model is now coordinated and sitting at the correct level on our topo surface. So we're now going to go ahead and share the coordinates. Select your Revit model. And in the properties palette, you'll notice here we have shared site. Currently, it's not shared. What we want to do is record the current position. If I click on change, if I had different positions set up in the uncoordinated model, I could select those. But in this case, this is building A. If I click OK and OK again, I'll now need to save the model. Notice now I have the location position change dialog box. This is just recognizing that the shared coordinate system has been established and now we're going to write some information back to the 004 uncoordinated model. Let's go ahead and click save. And the model is now saved. To have a look at the results, we'll now close down our site file. And we'll now go back and open up the uncoordinated model. So the first thing we'll note is in the site plan, you can see now that our models are quite a long way apart. Let's open up the ground floor plan. And we can see here that there doesn't seem to be any rotation. However, in the properties of the view here, you'll notice that the orientation is currently set to Project North. Let's set this to True North. And you can now see the rotation matches the survey. If I place a spot coordinate down to confirm the location, on the annotate ribbon, I can select spot coordinate. And you'll now notice that the coordinates match. Lastly, if I open up the south elevation and we review our levels, you'll note here that the ground floor level doesn't appear to have changed. However, if we select the level in the properties palette, select edit type, we can change the type properties here of the elevation base. You'll notice that the elevation base is set to the project base point. Let's go ahead there and change that to the survey point. Click OK to the type properties and all of our levels update. OK, so that confirms that our model is now coordinated. After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand structural columns, understand the difference between structural and architectural columns, place structural columns on grid, split columns, place slanted columns, and control the base and top constraints. The objective domains covered are 1.1D, work with structural columns. Structural columns are capable of transmitting compressive loads to other elements that are created below. These could be other elements such as foundations, structural floors, or similar. Revit contains two different types of columns, architectural or structural. Let's now take a look at the major differences of each. 
Architectural columns are useful as placeholders for architects as the finished column shape and size may not be yet known. These elements can be joined and materials will merge with other elements such as floors and walls. Structural columns can be placed vertically or slanted and also have an analytical model that's used for structural analysis. A structural column would also join to other structural elements. Go ahead and open up the file 005 Work with Structural Columns. Once the model is open, you'll note that it opens up in the 00 ground floor plan. Our first task is to place some concrete columns on the west wing of the building. On the structure ribbon, click column. Note on the context ribbon, we have the vertical column as the default placement method. Also note here that we have tag on placement again selected. On the options bar, you can place the column down to a depth of a level or in our case, up to a height. Here, we're going to go ahead and place our columns up to a height of 04 fourth floor. Also note here that we could place the columns unconnected to a desired height that we can enter here. In our case, we'll select the level 04 fourth floor. In the properties palette on the type selector, Note that the active column is concrete rectangular column 12 inch by 12 inch. As we zoom into grid 5, if you move your cursor over grid 5 and then press the space bar, you'll note that the column aligns to the grid. When you're over the intersection of two grids, you'll get the intersection snap. We can then go ahead and place a column down. Note, as the column's placed, it's also tagged. For the remainder of the column positions, we're going to use a tool, At Grids. On the context ribbon, select At Grids. Go ahead and select the following grids. Any grids that you haven't managed to select with a window, you can add with the control key held down. Revit will then preview each column on grid. Let's then go ahead and click finish. The columns are placed out, but you'll also note that the columns have been placed inside structural walls and also out on this grid position here that's not required. We'll just go ahead and click OK to this. We must then manually remove the unwanted columns. So our concrete columns are now placed. Next, we split the structural columns that we've just placed. In order to do this effectively, we'll need to elevate the west wing so that we have a view that's parallel to the columns that we've just placed. To create this view, select the view ribbon and then pick elevation. Note as we move our mouse over the shear wall, the elevation aligns to that wall. Let's go ahead and place the elevation in this position here. In the project browser, you'll now see that we have a new elevation, elevation 1A. Let's go ahead and open up that elevation. We can now see the columns that we've placed. If the section size changes as the structure gets higher, we might want to split these columns that we initially placed from ground floor up to fourth floor. To do this, we can select the modify ribbon and then we can go ahead and select the split element command. Note here that we can then pick to split the columns. Once the column is split, we can then select the column and change the section size as appropriate. If at a later date it's decided that the columns in fact do want to go all the way to the slab, we could delete the columns that we've just split 
select the two existing columns, and here I could attach top base. Let's select attach top base, and on the options bar, you can choose to attach the top or the base of the column to an element. The elements that you can attach to are roofs, floors, ceilings, beams, foundations, or reference planes. To demonstrate this, we're going to attach our columns to a sloping reference plane. Click the structure ribbon and then select ref plane. We can sketch a reference plane at an arbitrary angle, then select our two structural columns and select attach top base. On the options bar, we want to cut our column, but for the attachment justification here, we're going to select a maximum intersection. Select the reference plane, and you'll now note that the two columns are taken up to that reference plane. The warning is just stating that the structural columns are attached to a non-structural target. The columns will now stay attached to the reference plane. If we select the reference plane, and we reposition it, you can see the columns are parametrically attached. If we didn't want this relationship established, we could then go ahead and select the same two columns here, and I could detach top base. And here I could detach all. I could then go ahead and delete the reference plane, select the two structural columns, now in the properties palette, you'll notice that the top offset is differing for the two columns because they're raking. So you'll notice here we have a top offset of uh, 16 feet and nine inches. And here we have another offset of 14 foot and nine inches. I'm gonna select both of the structural columns and set the top offset to zero. Note now they return to the third floor. I can then change the level to fourth floor. Finally, we'll place our slanted columns. Let's change the view back to 00, zero ground floor. I'm going to go ahead and place a slanted column along grid two. The base of the slanted column will be on the intersection of the ground floor and this first reference plane. The top of the slanted column will intersect with the first floor and this reference plane here. To help us place this column, we're going to first need to cut a section to elevate grid two. On the quick access toolbar, select section. Sketch a section that's going to elevate grid two, and of course that remains parallel. We can then change our view depth, and then go ahead and open up section one. Of course here, you may need to change your crop region. We can now see the intersection of the ground floor and our reference plane here, and our first floor and this reference plane here. Feel free to change this scale, and also we'll change the detail level perhaps to fine. We're now ready to draw our slanted column. On the structure ribbon, select column. Note in the work plane dialog, we have to specify the work plane where we want to place the column. Let's select grid two. On the context ribbon, you'll note that the slanted column option is selected automatically. If we're not in a plan view, then it's assumed that we're placing a slanted column. In this example, I don't want a tag on placement, so I'm going to select tag on placement to remove that option. In the properties palette, I'm going to make sure that I have my HSS round column selected. I'm now ready to model the column. So I'm going to attach it to the intersection of ground floor and the first reference plane, and then the first floor and the outer reference plane. The warning here is just saying that some of the slanted columns will not be shown in a graphical column schedule. The column schedule can only display vertical columns. If we now return back to our ground floor plane, 
you'll now note that we have our slanted column placed. We can then copy that to the other two grid positions. Go ahead and select the slanted column. Select Copy. On the Options bar, check Multiple. And we'll place down the new slanted column on Grid 3 and Grid 1. Again, we are warned that these columns won't show in the graphical column schedule. Let's go ahead and open up the 3D view. And we can now see those columns placed. After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand structural walls, edit a wall profile, create a stacked wall, and create a compound wall. The objective domains covered are 1.1c, work with structural walls. Structural walls are load-bearing elements that can resist compressive forces from elements above. Structural walls can also resist shear loads. Architectural walls have many of the structural wall properties and can be converted to a structural wall if required. They are typically used for non-load-bearing functions such as internal partitions. Structural walls are load-bearing and can have an analytical model for transfer to structural analysis software. A stacked wall is two or more sub-walls that can be stacked together. In the example below, you can see two reinforced concrete walls are stacked with different thicknesses. Stacked walls are very convenient as you can place the walls in one simple command. A compound wall is a wall structure that can contain multiple vertical layers, such as masonry, concrete, and cavities, etc. In the example below, you can see that brick and block work are combined with a cavity wall. Go ahead and open up the file 006, Work with Structural Walls. Note that the file opens up in the ground floor plan. We begin by creating two shear walls. On the structure ribbon, click Wall. On the context ribbon, you'll note that we have Draw Tools. And on the Options bar, you'll notice that we can determine whether the wall is drawn up to a height or down to a depth. In this example, we'd like to draw to a height of 04 full floor. We can then define the location line for our wall. Are we defining the wall centre line, the finish face exterior or the finish face interior? We can then use the chain option to control whether we draw a single wall or a chain of walls. And finally, we have the ability to add an offset in. In my case, I'm going to uncheck chain. In the properties palette, you'll note that we can select the type of wall that we want to work with. In our example, we're going to use RC wall 12 inch. Let's go ahead and zoom up on grid 8. So we require a wall 4 feet long. And you can see, just using the temporary dimensions here, we can begin two feet away to the left of grid eight. And I can then define a wall four foot long. I can then repeat that on the other side. Our two shear walls are now complete. Next, we create a stacked wall for a basement construction. In the project browser, let's switch to minus 01 top of foundation. On the structure ribbon, select wall. And in the properties palette, go ahead and select stacked wall exterior 8 inch over 10 inch concrete wall. We are required to modify this type. Select the edit type button. And first, we're going to rename this wall type. We'll call this one RC wall 10 inch over 12 inch. We'll then select the edit button. And here we are in the edit assembly dialog box. 
To help us understand this better, you'll note that we have a preview window that we can enable on the left hand side. Currently, we're looking in section on this wall. So the first thing I'd like to do is change the type of wall used on the top. So you'll note here that we can see all of our basic wall styles from this pull down list. Let's choose RC wall 10 inches. For the base of the wall, we'll choose RC wall 12 inches. I'd like to have a height of two foot and six inches for the base wall and the remaining wall will go to the top of the wall constraint. Go ahead and click OK and OK again and you can see our new stacked wall is created. We can now model our stacked wall. On the context ribbon you'll note that we have our draw panel on the options bar, we can determine if our wall goes up to a height or down to a depth. In this case, we're modeling to a depth of our lift pit. Now here, I would like to define the exterior face of the wall. So we'll say finish face exterior, and I want to enable chain. So I can now model my wall. So I'm going to begin on the edge of the floor and grid 7. Note that I'm drawing in a clockwise fashion. This will ensure that the wall comes out the right way and also our location line is correct. So here I'm now going to trace around the edge of the slab and construct my wall. If we switch now to the 3D view, we can now see our basement wall. Yeah, we can clearly see the transition between the 12 inch wall and the 10 inch wall. Next, we create a compound wall for our lift core. Switch back to the 00, zero ground floor plan and zoom up on the lift core. So this is the wall we're going to go ahead and edit. In the properties palette, select the type selector and to begin, we're going to choose a generic six inch wall. Click edit type and then duplicate this style. So we'll name this wall six inch block work with render. We'll then click OK and select the edit button. Revit has retained the fact that we have a sectional view shown over here in our preview. And here we can simply now change the material to block work. We can do a simple search for block work in the materials browser and select concrete masonry units. You'll note that the thickness is already set to six inches, so we can leave that as is. We now want to create two new layers. We want to create a finish for our render, and this finish is going to go on both sides of the wall. The finishes normally need to go outside of the core boundary. So I'm going to select the insert button. Here, I'm going to go ahead and select finish one, and I'll select my suitable material. So here we can do a simple search for render, and go ahead and select wall render. The render thickness is one inch. And you notice here that it has a wraps function. That means the render can wrap around the wall. We'll now insert a third layer. If the layer doesn't come in the right position, we can use the up and down button here to position the layer correctly within the wall. So this again will be finish one. Here I can simply copy and paste the material name. And again, I will copy and paste the wall thickness. So we can now review our wall build up over here. And you can now see we have a suitable compound wall. I can click OK to my edit assembly dialog box. 
OK again to my type properties. And you'll now note that we have our new wall shown. In this example, we're going to change the constraints of our wall. In the properties padded, you'll note that the base constraint of the wall starts at ground floor. The top constraint goes all the way up to the fifth floor. Let's edit this and have the wall terminating on the first floor. After completing this lesson, you'll be able to edit wall joints, edit a wall profile and work with wall constraints. The objective domains covered are 1.1c, work with structural walls. When a wall intersects another wall, Revit by default will join the walls together. Often you may want to change the way the wall joins. For example, if a wall with unequal thicknesses needs to be joined, the butt joint can control which wall takes priority. If a wall is not at 90 degrees to another wall, it may be more preferable to use the square off option. By default, a wall's profile is rectangular. You can edit the shape of a wall by editing the wall's profile. In the example below, a retaining wall has a drainage hole and a sloped end. Go ahead and open up the file 006 Work with Structural Walls Part 2. The model will open up in the 3D view. We're going to be working with this retaining wall on the left hand side of the structure. The first task for us is to edit the wall joins. If we look at the configuration of how these walls are joined currently, you'll notice that this wall takes priority and this small wall in the middle is butting up to this wall here. I'd like to edit that condition and perhaps make both of the walls mitre. I can do this in 3D, but it will be easier to show you this in the plan view. So in the project browser, let's go ahead and open up the 00 ground floor plan. We can then zoom in to the same wall. On the modify ribbon, click wall joins. As you move over wall joins or wall ends, Revit displays a square in the plan or the 3D view. Let's select this position here. And you can see here that Revit displays the current butt configuration with a thin line. Up on the options bar, I can use previous or next to cycle between different butt joint configurations. In this example, however, we want to select mitre. Let's go ahead and select the next join. And once again, select mitre from the options bar. OK, so the wall joins are now configured. Here we can switch back to the 3D view and just review our changes. Next, we are required to change the depth of our walls. To do this, we're going to edit some of the wall constraints. This wall here requires to have a stepped foundation towards the end. In order to maintain this, I'm going to use the split command to split the wall. On the modifier walls context ribbon, you'll note that we have split element. Let's go ahead and split the wall. Once the wall is split, you can use the temporary dimension to control where the split happens. In this case here, we're going to make this 45 feet. We can then select the end wall and note in the properties palette, we have the ability to change the top offset or in fact the base offset of the wall. I'd like this wall to now go down one and a half feet. So in the base offset dialog box, I can type in minus 18 inches. And you'll now notice that the wall has dropped down. Next, we need to edit the wall profile. We need to incorporate a small drainage hole and also put a slope on the top of the retaining wall. Select the section of wall here. And on the context ribbon, we'll select edit profile. By default, a wall sketch is rectangular. Here, we're going to use the line tool and we're going to sketch an angled line. 
I would like to set a dimension on that angled line, so we'll select the annotate ribbon and click Angular. We can then pick the horizontal line and our new angled line and place a dimension. I'm then going to select my angled line that I've constructed and set the angle for six degrees. We can then add a circular profile into the wall for a drainage opening. On the draw panel, we can select circle. We'll sketch our circular opening in. In this example here, I would like the diameter of the opening to be six inches. So therefore we can make the radius three inches. I want to position this accurately on the profile, so I'll select my circle and in the properties padlet, we'll make center mark visible. I can then use the aligned dimension command to dimension my penetration. In this example here, I'll set this to eight foot And I'll set my elevation to one foot. Before we finish editing the wall profile, we'll need to tidy the top of the wall up. So I can delete this line here and then trim this line over here. And then we can go ahead and select finish edit mode. And you can now see we have our retaining wall with a drainage hole inside and also a step. After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand structural flaws, create a one-way and two-way spanning floor, create a sloping floor, attach walls to a floor, and add a slab edge. The objective domains covered are 1.1b, work with structural flaws, and 1.1c, work with structural walls, attaching a wall to a floor. A structural floor has load bearing capability and is usually positioned horizontally within buildings. Revit has two implementations of a floor. An architectural floor can be converted to a structural floor. This type of floor will normally contain the finishes and the compound layers. A structural floor can be converted to an architectural floor. This type of floor will be used for load bearing applications and structural analysis. A slab that is supported on its two longer sides is said to be a one-way spanning slab. The one-way spanning slab is designed only to resist bending moments in the short axes, and hence the main reinforcement is placed within this axis. A one-way spanning slab will typically be composite and have corrugated structural steel deck applied. The two-way spanning slabs will bend in both directions and will need moment-resisting reinforcement in both axes. A slab edge can be applied to a floor or foundation slab. It is typically applied to the edges of a floor and can create an edge for a raft foundation or upstands or downstands. It should be noted that a slab edge does not contain an analytical model, so careful consideration needs to be applied. An alternative to a slab edge is to utilize structural framing or a structural wall. Go ahead and open up the file 008 Work with Structural Floors Part 1. You'll notice that this model opens up in the 00 ground floor plan. Our first task is to draw a two way spanning slab in this area of the structure. To begin, let's select the structure ribbon and then the floor. You'll currently notice we're in the boundary line mode. We have three modes when working with floors boundary line, which is where we draw our plan shape of our slab, slope arrow, which is where we can define a slope or a fall in one direction, or a span direction, which is how we can define a one-way or a two-way span in slab. Let's go back to the boundary line mode and make sure we've selected line. In the properties padlet, let's ensure that we've selected the RC slab 12 inch. As I start to draw my boundary, I require an 18 inch offset from the grid line. 
You'll notice on the options bar, we have the facility of adding in an offset. I can then begin to draw my slab. It's important that I draw in a clockwise direction. This will ensure that the offset comes out on the correct side. I can now switch to start end radius arc. And then return back to line. Clear my offset and set that to zero. And then finalize the shape of the slab. In this example, the span direction doesn't matter, but you can see here that we have a span direction symbol. If I wanted to, I could pick on span direction and I could select another edge. In the properties palette, you'll note here that we have a height offset from level. So what this is going to do is place the slab at the level ground floor with an additional six inch offset. We want this to be on the level, so we'll set that to zero. We can then go ahead and select the finish edit mode. Your slab is now created. Let's look in the 3D view and check our model. Next, we model our one way spanning composite deck. To do this, let's open up the 01 first floor plan. You'll note here that we have some steel beams that are going to support our deck. And we'll begin by clicking the structure ribbon and then selecting floor. Let's ensure that in the type selector, we have selected our RC composite slab a inch. Now, before we go ahead and use this, let's take a moment to look at the buildup of this composite slab. Go ahead and select edit type and then select Edit. You'll note here that we have our preview showing. If the preview's not showing, you can use this button in the bottom left of the dialog box just to show the preview of our assembly. And you'll note here that we have two layers. We have our main structural layer over here, which is our normal weight concrete, eight inches thick. And we then also have a structural deck underneath that. The structural deck is simply a profile family. Here are the different profiles loaded into this particular project, but of course we could download a new profile or simply draw our own profile. It has to be noted that the structural deck will not be modelled in 3D. This is simply a two dimensional detail that we'll see in section or elevation. Let's go ahead and click OK to the edit assembly dialog box and OK again to the type properties dialog. We're now ready to create our boundary for our slab. Now the boundary we create is going to be a rectangular boundary representing the steel deck. So on the draw tools, let's select rectangle. We'll trace off the grid lines. And now we want to create a cantilever. So let's go ahead and select those boundary lines that we've just created. And on the options bar, you'll notice here that we have concrete cantilevers. So here I want to achieve a six inch cantilever. So I'm going to put in negative six inches. And you'll now notice that we have a black boundary line going around the outside of the structure. So this is going to be my plain concrete that cantilevers beyond the deck. In the properties palette, again, ensure that your height offset from level is set to zero. We can now go ahead and complete the deck. Let's click the finish edit mode. To help us understand what we've modeled, we'll create a section through our floor. On the quick access toolbar, click the section tool and create a section through your floor slab. We can then go ahead and look at that section. I'll set my scale to something appropriate and the detail level to fine. And we can now see our floor. We'll note the steel deck is showing in two dimensions and we have our concrete cantilever over the edge of the steel deck. Next, we create a sloping floor slab. 
In the project browser, open up the plane 05 fifth floor. Here, we're going to create a slab on top of the core with a 60 degree fall. To do this, on the structure ribbon, select floor. Let's ensure here that we're using our six inch concrete slab. On the context ribbon, note we're in the boundary line mode, and here we're going to utilize pick walls. On the options bar, note that we have a one foot offset. I can then simply go around and pick the boundary of my walls, and then I can go to slope arrow. Now here, I would like to pick the line that's going to determine my slope. So that's going to be this line here. The height offset at tile is going to be set to zero. I want to actually specify a slope. So here I can put in six degrees. And now we can go ahead and finish edit mode. Now Revit does ask me if I want to attach the walls to the underside of its floor. Normally I would click yes, but I want to show you how to do this using some other tools. So let's select no, and then open up the 3D view. You'll now notice our walls and our slab. So we're then gonna select all of our structural walls and attach them to the floor. To do this, let's select the walls with a crossing window, up on the context ribbon, you'll note we have modifier walls. Here, we're going to attach top base. On the options bar, I can determine whether I'm attaching the top of the wall or the base of the wall. In this case, it's the top of the wall, and we can then simply select our floor. The walls are now attached. If the slab changes angle, then the walls will adapt. So I'm going to select the slab, and note here we have our six degree pitch. Let's change that to 12. And of course, we can see all of those walls adapt. Finally, we create a slab edge. In the 3D view, you'll note here that we have our original ground floor slab that we created. On the structure ribbon, select the floor drop down and select floor slab edge. In the properties palette, select edit type and you'll note here that we're using this particular profile i'm going to change this to a slab edge thickened 36 by 12 and here we have our material we'll then rename our slab edge and i'll just amend the 24 inch to 36 inch and select ok and ok again we can then simply select the edges where we want to apply our slab edge. You'll notice that we have an inbuilt flip tool where we can actually flip the profile of the slab edge if it was in the incorrect position. Let's switch to our ground floor plane. To help us understand what we've modeled, we'll create a section through our slab edge. Again, we can go ahead and change the scale and the detail level. And there's our slab edge. The slab edge will stay associated to the edge of our floor. So if the floor boundary changes, the slab edge will follow. After completing this lesson, you'll be able to work with shape editing tools, create a shaft opening and edit a floor profile. The objective domains covered are 1.1b, work with structural floors. Shape editing tools can be utilised on structural floors to enable a series of complex facets to be created. With the use of the split line, you can ensure that the facets remain planar and are not warped. In the example below, you can see a basement slab with a point added to the centre of the slab for drainage. This can be applied to one layer of the slab, in this case the screed. Shaft openings are a convenient and fast method of adding vertically aligned openings through multiple floors. Symbolic lines can be drawn that automatically appear on each floor that is cut by the opening. 
Go ahead and open up the model 009 Work with Structural Floors Part 2. You'll note that the model opens up in the lift pit plan. Let's go ahead and zoom up on our core. Our first task is to create a slope on a slab to help with drainage in the bottom of our lift pit. To model the floor on the structure ribbon, select the floor command. In the properties padded, click the type selector and ensure that our 3 inch screed on 8 inch RC slab is set. Before we go ahead and model with this, let's take a look at how this slab is set up. Select the edit type button, and then go ahead and select edit. In the edit assembly dialog box, let's ensure that we're looking at a preview. And you can see here that we have two layers in our core boundary. We have our concrete, which is eight inches thick. And on top of that, we then have a screed sitting on the slab. But you'll note that we also have this variable option over here. So this variable option is going to allow us to shape edit just this layer. So the concrete will stay flat and level and the screed will then have a fall angle to produce the fall for our drainage. OK, let's click OK and OK again to the type properties dialog. Our total slab thickness is 11 inches. Let's set the height offset from level to 11 inches. We'll then go ahead and select the rectangle tool to create the boundary for our slab. Let's now go ahead and finish edit mode. So our slab is now created. We're now going to utilize the shape editing tools on the context ribbon. Note that we have a tool here called add point. Let's select add point and we'll place a point in the center of our slab. Now this point needs to be accurately placed. So we're going to use aligned dimensions to make sure that the point is correctly dimensioned. You may need to use the tab key here to cycle through selections. So once again, I'll use the tab key. And now we're going to set the position. So I can select my point, click on the dimension, and I'm going to use a little formula here. So we'll say equals nine feet and three inches divided by two. And of course that sets the point into the center of the slab in this direction. We'll repeat that over here. So again, we can make this equal to six feet and two inches and divide that by two. And our point is now secure in the center. Let's go ahead and select that point. And here I'm going to drop this down negative two inches. And you'll now notice that our slab is falling to the center point. To help us understand what we've modeled, let's create a section. We'll sketch the section horizontally across the screen, but we want to make sure that the section is aligned to that point that we've just placed. So we can go ahead and use the align command. Again, I can use the tab key to go and pick up our shape editing point and then pick the section. So we'll then go ahead and look at that section. We can change the scale and the detail level. And here you can see our concrete slab with the screed with the full angles over the top. OK. Next, we go ahead and create a shaft opening. Let's go and open up the top of foundation plan. So here we're going to create our shaft opening. On the structure ribbon, click shaft. This is a mode driven command and you'll note we have two modes. We have the boundary line mode, which is where we define the plan shape of our structural opening. And then we also have the symbolic line mode where we can draw the opening graphics that we would like to see on each floor. In the properties palette, we can set our level for the base constraint and also the top constraint where our shaft opening is going to stop. So in our case here, you can see that it's going to go from the top of foundation up to ground floor. I need to edit this. We need to have the shaft opening going all the way up to the fourth floor. 
OK, so we're now ready to create our boundary line opening. So we'll select the rectangle tool. And we can sketch our opening. You'll note here that when I sketch the opening, I'm creating it on the outside of my structural walls. The structural walls will form the cores. We can then select the symbolic line option and I can sketch in here my opening graphics. Now when I do this on the options bar, it's preferable to remove the chain option as you generally just want to draw single lines. OK, so we'll just sketch those symbolic lines in like so. Our sketch is now complete and we just simply now click the finish edit mode. Let's go up to the first floor just to take a look at our plan graphics. And you can now see the opening graphics are showing in that level. If we open up the sectional view, we can now see a shaft is in place. If I ever want to edit the shaft, you'll notice that I can select it in plan or section. And I can then edit the vertical extents of the shaft utilizing the properties palette or click edit sketch and change the plan representation of my shaft. Finally, we'll edit the profile of our first floor slab to create some drainage pipe openings. So let's click back to our first floor plan. And you'll note here that we can select the edge of our floor. Once that's done, on the ribbon, you'll note we can edit boundary. I can now zoom into my boundary, and here I want to add some circular openings to my slab. So here I can click the circle tool, and we'll sketch a three inch opening, which will give me a six inch diameter hole. And I'm going to copy that. So I want 12 inches between these holes. Right, so and then my three openings created. Of course, what I can then do is move them into the correct position. And then go ahead and select the finish edit mode. I'm going to say no because I don't want to attach these walls. And there's my slab. To help us understand how this may look, let's go into the 3D view. And in the 3D view, with the slab still selected, I can isolate the view. So I'm going to select temporary hide isolate. And we just want to isolate this single element. So you'll now see my shaft opening incorporated in here, as well as my opening through the single first floor slab. OK. After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand structural framing, understand structural usage and create concrete and steel beams. The objective domains covered are 1.1e, work with structural framing and connections. Beams are load bearing structural elements that form an important part of structural framing systems. They must primarily resist bending and axial loads and are often connected to columns and walls to transfer the loads to other structural elements. Beams can be formed from a variety of materials such as in situ concrete, precast concrete, steel or timber. The type of material used has an important effect on how elements are joined to other elements. This property is called the model behavior and it is set in the Revit family parameters. In the example shown, a concrete frame will join and become monolithic, but other concrete members such as precast steel or timber will have a gap between the elements. The structural usage of a beam determines its rank, a girder being a primary member, a joist being a secondary member and a purling being a tertiary member. Revit automatically detects the structural usage based on what the beam is connected with. If no connection exists on one or both ends, then Revit will set the usage to other. However, structural usage can be overridden if required.
go ahead and open up the file 010 work with structural framing. The model will open up in the first floor plan. Our first task is to draw some girders in the front section of the model. On the structure ribbon, let's select beam. On the context ribbon, you'll note that we have the ability to load a new family. We have our draw panel displayed with various different drafting tools. We can place our beams on grids and also tag those beams as we place them. On the options bar, the placement plane is the level that the beams will be sitting on. By default, this will match the floor plane. So in this case, we're on level 01, first floor. But you can see here that we can override and change that if we require. The structural usage is set to automatic, so Revit would auto detect the structural usage of the framing based on what I model the beams between. However, I could override this if required. You'll also notice here that I have the chain option switched on. In the properties palette, in the type selector, go ahead and select W16 by 26. As I model my beam, you'll note that I'm going to snap from the column midpoint to the column endpoint here. Before I go too much further, let's open up the 3D view and have a look at how this beam has been modelled. You'll note here that although I snapped from column centre to column centre, the beam is in fact cut back to the columns. The analytical model will still remain connected to those column centres, but the physical size of the beam will cut back to the bounding box of the column. This is due to the material usage of our beam. OK, let's switch back to the first floor plan. We'll now continue to draw some more girders. Here, I'm going to select the original girder I've just drawn. And up on the context ribbon, I'm going to click Create Similar. We can now draw our second girder. I would now like to create the rolled beam around the front of the structure. To do this, I can select the start end radius arc and then go ahead and snap to the column endpoint, the column endpoint here, and finally the endpoint on this raking column here. Again, if we look in 3D, we can now see our beams are modelled. Next, we're going to model an in situ beam across this part of the structure to give the floor slab a little bit of extra support. So let's return back to the first floor plane. On the structure ribbon, let's select beam. In the properties palette, we're now going to ensure that we have concrete rectangular beam 12 inch by 24 inch selected. We can now draw our concrete beam between the column midpoints. Notice that the difference here is this in situ beam will join and become monolithic to the column. Next, we investigate the difference between a girder, a joist and a purding. To do this, on the structure ribbon, let's select the beam command. In the properties palette, click the type selector. We're going to change our section to W12 by 26. Now, when I model the frame in here, this slab is slightly lower because it's a steel deck. So what I can do here is change my placement plane. And you'll notice here, I already have a reference plane set up called 01 top of steel. Even though I'm on the first floor plane, when I create this structural framing, it will now be constrained to that reference plane. So now I'm going to model my girders. If I select one of the girders that I just created here, in the properties palette, you'll note that the structural usage is set to girder. We're now going to create some joists across this framing system. So once again, we can select our beam. 
we'll select create similar now just for this example here I'm going to create a joist in between the two primary beams and I'll create a second one through here if I select this member you'll now note that the structural usage is set to joist if I now create another beam this time I'm going to span between the two joists and we then go ahead and select that member you can now see the structural usage is set to a purding if I create another beam and I just model this without connecting it to any other elements and I select that beam you'll notice the structural usage is set to other here of course we can change that though I could go back and say actually it's a girder the significance of this is it can determine how the structural framing looks in a coarse level of detail if I temporarily switch to coarse level of detail and I toggle on thick lines you can now see clearly we have different thicknesses for our structural framing now this can be set up in the object styles and you don't have to accept this style but you can see each of the different structural usages will display differently with this particular template now of course if I don't want that to happen I could simply override so here I could set this to a joist and you can see the appearance now changes after completing this lesson you will be able to apply and remove coping create beam systems and create trusses the objective domains covered are 1.1e work with structural framing and connections coping can be applied to structural framing and structural columns when two or more members intersect by default steel framing has a join cutback of half an inch in order to add coping you will need to edit the join cutback and then apply the coping coping is a fast alternative method of cleaning up drawings and the model when steel connections are not being modeled if a steel connection is placed on the beam then many traditional Revit tools such as coping and cutting beams are deactivated beam systems are very convenient when adding a number of joists to the framing bay the span direction can be controlled and the beam system will adapt if the boundary changes a beam system can be used in 2d or 3d so it's very useful for adding light gauge steel work perhaps on vertical planes a truss is an assembly of beams and bracing elements that form a rigid structure when assembled together they are typically found in roofs and floors where long spans are desirable Revit can create any type of truss and trusses can be attached to floors and roofs which will then remain associative back to those elements go ahead and open up the model 010 work with structural framing part 2 you'll note that this particular model opens up in the second floor top of steel plan if we zoom up to the front of the structure here we're going to begin by adding in some beam systems click the structure ribbon and then select beam system on the context ribbon you'll note that we have two methods to create a structural beam system we can use automatic beam system or sketch beam system we also have the ability to tag these on placement I'm going to choose not to tag these and on the options bar we can configure the beam type that we want to use and the layout rule in our case here we'll go to maximum spacing and here we'll set a maximum spacing of eight feet you'll now note that as I move my cursor over closed framing base Revit previews the beam system when we're ready to place the beam systems we can simply select and you can see the beam systems are then placed let's go ahead and review that in 3d and you can now see our secondary beam systems placed next we use the same beam system to put some framing in these roof bays on the structure ribbon go ahead and select beam system this time you'll see that we have a different context menu first thing we're going to do is set our working plane so here we're going to ensure that we have reference plane roof plane selected this is an inclined plane where the girders are modeled 
In this example, we can simply pick the supports for our beam system. As I pick each support, you'll notice that this symbol here is determining the framing direction. That's correct, but if I wanted to change that, I could use the beam direction mode, and then I could pick another beam. Once I'm happy with this, I can select Finish Edit Mode, and my beam system is placed. So I may choose to edit my beam system, so I can simply select the beam system, and then in the Properties palette, I can make some changes. So here, for example, I might want to change the section size. And you can see the beam system updates. Next, you model two trusses to create our sky bridge. In the project browser under structural plans, let's go ahead and open up the fourth floor. Our sky bridge needs to go from the core to this area over here. And you'll notice we have two structural columns underneath the slab to support our sky bridge. The sky bridge is going to be modeled with trusses. On the structure ribbon, select truss. Let's review some of the settings in the properties palette. So you'll note here that the bearing cord is on the bottom and also our bearing vertical justification is also set to bottom. The truss height is eight foot. And you can see here we're using a custom family for our sky bridge. If I click on edit type, here we can review some of the sections that we're using. So the top cords are using our square section, same with our vertical webs and our diagonal webs, and the bottom cord is again using the same as the top cord, a slightly deeper square section, in this case eight by eight inches. Both the vertical webs and the diagonal webs are using a six by six inch member. So here, I'm going to create the truss from the end point of this wall to the center point of this column. And we'll do the same on the other side. Let's switch back to the 3D view to review our truss. And here, you can see our sky bridge. Now, the sky bridge is pitching up at the start Let's review some of the properties. If we select this truss here, you may note that the start level offset is set one foot above the end level offset. Well, with any structural framing or trusses, we can obviously amend and edit these settings. I could change the reference level for my truss and the start level and end level offsets. In this case, let's set the start level offset to zero. And you can now see the truss adapts. We'll do the same with the other truss. We'll set the start level offset to zero. Another thing to note with a truss is it doesn't have to be vertical. So we could take this truss and we could rotate it through 90 degrees. Also, the bearing cord could be set to the top rather than the bottom. And you can now see the truss is set out from its top cord. OK, so there's the sky bridge created with the trusses. Next, we look at beam column joins and coping. Let's start with beam column joins. So on the roof section here, you can see that we have stub beams over here carrying these rectangular hollow sections. And you can see if we look at the condition at the end of these RHS sections, we really need to tidy those sections up a little bit. If you select the Modify Ribbon, you'll note here that we have a tool called Beam Column Joins. If I go ahead and select that tool, you'll notice here that we get arrows where we can direct each section. So here you can see that this member is butting up to this member, but I could reverse that by shortening this top member and then increasing this member here. And now I have the opposite configuration. Without shortening the member, if I push this member into this member, then it forces a mitre. So let's look at that again over here. So again, I can push these two members together and form a mitre. And I'll do the same over here. And one more in here. Let's now go ahead and look at coping. 
In the project browser, go ahead and open up the second floor plan. Let's zoom up on our beam system. And here we're going to create a section to elevate this joist. So on the quick access toolbar, select section. And we'll create a section that's going to elevate that joist. We can change the depth and go ahead and open up the section. We'll change the scale and also the detail level. So here we can see our joist and also our girder. The first thing we'll need to do is extend our joist into the girder. Before we do that, if we select this joist, let's take a look at the properties palette. And you'll notice here that we have something called start join cutback and end join cutback. By default, this is half an inch. So that's given us a half an inch gap between the edge of this beam here and the bounding box of our girder. What we're now going to do is override that. On the context ribbon, you'll notice we have change reference. Let's go ahead and select that. Instead of cutting back to the bounding box of the girder, we can now pick the web. And you'll now see the joist has extended. On the modify ribbon, we can now click cope. So here we select the member we're coping and then the member it's coping back to, which is our girder. Once we've created the cope, we can also control the gap. Let's select the joist. In the properties palette, you'll notice here we have coping distance. So I'm going to update this and have this as half an inch. And there's our notch. Now, just so we can see that notch in 3D, let's go back to our 3D view. We can right mouse click on our view cube and we're going to orientate our view to section one. And of course, here we can now see our joist and we can now see the notch into the girder. After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand bracing, create a framing elevation, create vertical bracing, create horizontal bracing, and understand framing properties. The objective domains covered are 1.1e, work with structural framing and connections. Bracing members are designed to resist lateral loads, typically from wind and seismic forces. Normally a brace is constructed from materials such as steel that can resist both tension and compression. A brace is a specific element inside Revit with a unique set of properties that enables efficient modelling and setting out. You should not use beams to represent bracing. Go ahead and open up the file 010 Work with Structural Framing Part 3. You'll notice that the model opens up in the 3D view. We're going to start by creating some vertical bracing in this area of the structure. To create the vertical bracing, we first must create a framing elevation. The framing elevation will need to be created in a floor plane. In our project browser, let's go ahead and open up the 00 ground floor plan. Let's now zoom up on grid 3. And our framing elevation will elevate all the framing along grid 3. To create the framing elevation, Let's click the view ribbon and then pick the elevation drop down and select framing elevation. You'll now notice that when we hover over a grid line, the framing elevation symbol would attach itself to the grid. Notice as I move my mouse either side of the grid line, the framing elevation would either look outside or inside the structure. On the options bar, Attach to grid is selected. This is the default option and the one we generally want when we're creating bracing. I'm going to go ahead and place down my framing elevation. You'll now notice in the project browser that a new folder has created elevations framing elevation. Let's then go ahead and open up elevation 1a. 
you'll note that the crop region goes to the full extent of the structure. I'm going to edit that so we can select the crop region and use the segment handle to reduce the height of our crop. We'll then change the scale and our detail level. So I'm now ready to model my vertical bracing. On the structure ribbon, select brace. You'll note on the context ribbon, we only have the option of drawing a straight line since this is a tension component. In the properties palette, click the type selector and just ensure that our flat bars are selected. When we draw our first element, it's really important that we attach it first to the column and then second to the top of the beam. I can ensure that I'm attaching to the correct elements by keeping an eye on the status bar in the bottom left of Revit. You'll notice now it says nearest to structural framing. I can then go ahead and place this at an arbitrary position. The accuracy of this placement doesn't matter too much at the moment. We'll use the properties palette to get this into an X braced configuration. I'll then repeat that on the other side. And there's my brace in placed. What we now need to do is use the properties palette and the constraints to accurately position our vertical bracing. Let's start with this braced member here. I'm going to expand the properties palette so we can fully read all of the properties. Let's start here. So you'll note that I have a start attachment level reference. This has attached itself at the minute to the top of foundation. I'm going to change that to ground floor and set my attachment elevation to zero. You'll now notice that the bracing starts at the ground floor level. The end attachment type is currently set to distance. And here we've got roughly seven feet from the end of the beam to this position here. The end attachment type is presently set to distance. I'm going to change this to ratio. The ratio will range from zero being the start of the beam and then one being the end of the beam. For example, if I type in 0.25 for the ratio, you can see that the brace then snaps a quarter of the way along the beam. In our case here, let's set this to one. I'll then repeat that for the brace on the other side. So once again, we can set this to the ground floor level. We can set a start attachment elevation to zero, change the distance to ratio, and set the ratio in this case to zero. So our bracing is now complete. Let's switch to the 3D view and we can review our bracing. Now, you will notice here that actually we have a clash between the two braced elements. I'm going to resolve that by offsetting one of these braced elements in the Y axis. I'm going to select this brace here and notice in our properties we have Y offset value. The thickness of the bracing is 3 eighths of an inch, so I'm going to offset it 3 eighths, like so. And you can now see that this member is now in front of this member here. Using a ratio to set out the bracing is a good idea. If the bay changes size, then the bracing would automatically adapt. Next, we create some horizontal bracing on our roof structure. So here on the roof, we require to place some circular hollow sections for the roof bracing. On the structure ribbon, let's select brace. In the properties palette in the type selector, let's ensure that we're using our three and a half inch round structural tube. On the options bar, you'll note here that we have 3D snapping enabled. This is quite important. You'll notice as I now move over the frames here, I can snap to these frames in three dimensions. So my first brace is going to be attached to this beam here and then to this beam here. And I'll draw a second braced member across in the opposite direction. So again, we've got an X configuration for our bracing. Let's begin by setting out this braced element here. So when I pick this element, again, we have the same settings in our properties palette. So you'll note here that we have start attachment type. I'm going to set this to ratio. And once again, I'll set the ratio to zero. 
and we'll do the same over here. This is going to be set to a ratio and set that to zero. Now also at this end, we also need to be at zero and this member's now correctly set out. This member here is going to give us a bit of a problem because actually this beam here is in one length. So in order to set this out, I actually need to know the distance from this point here to this point here. To measure that, I'm going to open up the fifth floor plan. So I can now see my bracing in plan and I can also see the distance I need to measure. So on the quick access toolbar, I'm going to select measure between two references. And I'm going to measure between the center of this column here and the intersection here of these two beams. If we take a look at our value here, it's approximately 25 foot, two and a quarter inches. So if I select my brace, in this case, I'm clicking it in the plan view, you'll notice here that I can set this distance. Now here, I can type in 25 foot and two and a quarter inches. Right, so, and you can see the brace is now uh, directed to the correct location. However, that is dependent on this end of attachment to reference. Is that reference in the end of the beam or the start of the beam? So we've got to be a bit mindful about that as well. Now, something you will notice is that my symbolic line for my bracing is actually off axis. If I select both braced elements, you'll notice here that we have structural usage. I'm going to go ahead and set this to kicker bracing. And you'll now notice the bracing's positioned down on the center lines. If we go into the 3D view, you can now see our bracings configured quite nicely in that bay. The last thing to do is perhaps set the Z offset value so the two braces don't clash in the center of the bay. So I'm going to opt to uh, offset this member down and this member up. So the diameter of our tubing is three and a half inches. So here you'll note we have our Z offset value. So here I could set this to 1.75 inches and that moves up. And then this one here can be set to negative 1.75 inches. And our bracing now doesn't clash. After completing this lesson, you will be able to understand structural connections, load and place steel connections, modify steel connections, and copy steel connections. The objective domains covered are 1.1e, work with structural framing and connections. Steel connections play an important role in the integrity of a structure. Typically, the type of structural connection is specified by the structural engineer. However, the fabricator may create the actual connection to suit their machinery and manufacturing processes. In Revit, careful consideration should be given to the use of connections, as once a connection is placed on an element, other tools such as cut, cope and align are disabled. Go ahead and open up the model 010, Work with Structural Connections. The model will open in the 3D view. Before we can use structural connections, we must first load the connections we would like to utilize in this project. To do this, on the structure ribbon, select the connection settings tool. In the structural connection settings dialog box, you'll note that we have our available connections on the left hand side and our loaded connections displayed on the right hand side. To help us navigate through the available connections, we have the connection group filters. So I'm going to start here by selecting plates at beam. And in here, I shall add the base plate. I also want to add a clip connection, and that's under platform beams. And here we have clip angle. Let's also add that. Click OK to the structural connection settings dialog. To place the connection, we'll first select the structure ribbon and then select a connection. In the properties palette in the type selector, select base plate. We can select the column that we wish to attach the base plate to and then either press enter or spacebar to finish. 
The connection is then modelled. So we're now going to make some modifications to this structural connection. Go ahead and select the structural connection that you've just placed. And notice in the properties palette in the type selector, we currently have a type called base plate. Let's click edit type and first duplicate our base plate type. So for the new name for our base plate, we'll type in BP2. And then we can modify the parameters for base plate 2. In the edit connection type dialog box, you'll note that we have a live preview on the left hand side. Note here that we can orbit around this by holding the shift and middle mouse button. On the right hand side of the dialog box, we can configure the connection. So let's start with the plate thickness. So I'm quite happy with one inch, so I'll leave that as is. You'll then note that the column shortening is uh, governed by the plate thickness. I'm going to change this to a value and I'm going to put a shortening of two inches in here. And what that will do is that will give me an inch here to allow for grout for the base plate. I'll now select base plate dimensions. And here you can see that we've got an initial projection of three inches. I'm going to change that to four inches and you can see the base plate grows in size. If we select anchor and holes, here we can choose our type of anchor that we want to use. So in this example here, I'm going to use a threaded anchor. And here we can choose our anchor size. So here we'll have three quarters of an inch. You'll also notice here that we can configure the anchor assembly, which controls how many washers we have and so on. OK, so let's now set the anchors parallel to the web. So here we have two anchors. Uh, of course, we can change this. I could say I wanted uh, three anchors perhaps in there. And you can now see we have three anchors. In this case, though, we only want two. And we'll configure the intermediate distance to 12 inches. We'll also set the anchors parallel to the flange. And that would also be 12 inches. Finally, let's select the holes option here and click on grout holes. And here we want to enable a grout hole and we want a grout hole of one inch. So our base plate is now configured. Select OK to the edit connection type and OK again to the type properties and our connection will update. Also note here we have our one inch gap between the plate and the floor slab. Next, you copy the connection to similar columns. Select your connection, right mouse click and select propagate connection. The connections will begin to background process. And you'll now notice the connections are populated. Because all the connections are the same type, if I go back and edit the type, all of those base plates will update and change. The advantage of having the structural connections now in our BIM model is that we can now better communicate our design intent to the fabricator.